it's all about preaching. <laughs> like that. And we need to understand that this preaching is so needed today in the world because the world is somewhat headed in a very dangerous direction right now. <laughs> Although there have been so many cataclysmic wars in the history of mankind, people still don't learn, and they're on the verge of another one. They're eager to, to have another war. And they can't see that before that, so many wars, so many mil millions of people died, so many destructions, so much calamity, so many misfortune because of war, but still people don't learn. They're ready for war again. Now, this is because they're so attached to lust and greed. These two things, lust, greed, and envy, cause the living entity to become mad. <laughs> I was listening to Srila Prabhupada speaking this morning, and he was saying, when, you're, when you are affected by lust, you can't see anything clearly. You can't see yourself clearly, you can't see others clearly, you can't see anything clearly. So lust blinds a person, and when lust turns into anger, it becomes the destruction force. And when it becomes full-blown, it turns into war. <laughs> lust means to satisfy my senses at the expense of others, for whatever way. And then when that is not done, one becomes angry. And because in this world, this is a world of competition. Everyone is competing for others over the stolen property that belongs to the Lord. Everything belongs to the Lord, but people are fighting over stolen property. This is my country. Just like in America, the most horrible thing is happening now. And it's front page in the news now. People who are traveling across the border from Mexico want to get into the United States, but they have, they have uh, put up this uh, you know, strong guard now. So these are immigrants who are running away from their country for whatever reason. And they're capturing them and put them in detention camps. And they're separating the children from the parents. <laughs> so there's a huge protest all over the United States now that they did. this is cruelty, separating parents from children, <laughs> like that. So this is going on right now. So you can see one there's this like one calamity after another. And when it gets out of hand, then it becomes uh, you know people start killing each other wholesale. <laughs> So, so preaching is needed because if somebody takes to Krishna consciousness or at least becomes favorable, and then their mind is directed in the right way, and then they're on their way back to, uh, let me say, pure, proper consciousness. So this is the highest welfare work is to preach Krishna consciousness. You have your upcoming... Uh, uh, Padayantra, which is very, it's which I think is one of the most powerful point of forms of preaching. It reaches so many people with books, with Harinam, with the association of devotees, and it's a wonderful opportunity to spread Krishna consciousness. So everyone should take part in this. I wish I could come, but my schedule doesn't allow it, <clears throat> at least right now. So, this Padayantra is, is not just a fun thing that we just travel around and, you know, camp out at night and toast marshmallows in the evening. It's not like that. It's, it's an opportunity for, you know, to reach so many conditioned souls with this mercy. Jai Panchatattva Ki Jai. And so take part of it in an enthusiastic way. And this Prabhupada, Prabhupada speaking. He's a good preacher. Now he's distributing books very nicely. You are also a good book distributor. He's talking to one devotee. Huh, in the beginning she was distributing nicely, so preaching is our life. The more we preach, the more we are successful. 
Any temple that preaches becomes successful. Temples that don't preach, they have so many problems. Yari Deka Tahi Krishna Tahi Kaha Krishna Pades Amara Jiva Amara Gya Guru Hoi Tara E Desh Yari Deka Tahi Kaha Krishna Pades This is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Every one of you become guru and deliver the residence of your neighborhood, A Desh. Wherever you are living, just deliver them. Become their guru. How to become guru? It is not difficult. Tare Yare Deki Tare Kaha Krishna Upades. What Krishna has said, you speak. You simply repeat, that's all. You become guru. So this should be preached all over the world. You learn from Bhagavad Gita and repeat. You simply say, Krishna said four things. Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakto Mam Yaji Mam Namaskaru. Just always think of me, Krishna says. Just become my devotee, worship me and offer obeisances. Kindly do these four things. So if you can induce one person to these four things, you become guru. Is there any difficulty? <laughs> then you become a devotee of Krishna. How? Always think of Krishna. Worship Krishna and offer obeisances. Here is our temple. Please come, offer obeisances. Offer a little flower if you can secure. Otherwise, obeisance is sufficient. And chant Hare Krishna. You become guru. To inform this message is difficult. Not to inform this message is difficult. Prabhupada's asking. Not at all. You may carry the message. If you're fortunate, he'll do it. If he's if he's fortunate, he'll do it. If he does not do it, you are carrying the message. You become recognized by Krishna. Here's the point. Even if you fail. You become recognized by Krishna just by trying. Bhakti Siddhanta used to say, <coughs> if we, we hold a program and nobody comes, you preach to the four walls. They will hear. <laughs> he says, a preacher preaches even if there's nothing, nobody there to talk to. <laughs> Still you preach. So he's giving us the how how meritorious this preaching is that even if nobody takes it still if you do it you recognize my krishna nacha tasman manusesu kasthit me priya krita moha you are doing sincerely then you are recognized by krishna just like a canvasser salesman he goes to the market tries his best to secure some business the master sees the report how he has worked even though he has not secured a single pice but he has tried to introduce the goods, then he's bona fide. He's bona fide. Similarly, we have to simply carry the message of Krishna and try to convince people. If one is convinced, it is good. If not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so not attached to the results, we're attached to the, end, to the preaching. I'm not going to... Then you are recognized by Krishna. Recognition means you become the dearest servant of Krishna. Then what more do you want? If Krishna recognizes that you are my most dear servant, then what do you want more? Yare Deke Tare Kaha Krishna Upadesh. Prabhupada's given us the clear. So we think, I can't really preach. Try. <laughs> Even if you fail, you're recognized by Krishna as long as you sincerely try once on. But it, but nowadays, if you sincerely try, Krishna somehow or other makes it happen. And even if you you try, yes, yes, like yesterday we were, you know, chanting and dancing downtown, and so many people, if they see the devotees doing that, they they get benefited. I was I was walking back with. Uh, with uh, Ananda Vardhana, we were walking back. And one lady, she was riding a bicycle coming from the other side, look, coming towards us. And she, she looked, and she was looking like, who are these people? And then I offered my obeisances to her, and she, she smiled, and she, her eyes got big, you know. So that she makes advancement. Just because she's appreciating the devotees. So, yeah, and we were chanting, and then one lady, she hands somebody flowers, 
Then she hands me a big bouquet of flowers. So she's just enthusiastically grabbing flowers from her flower stand and giving it. How much advancement she makes. She's serving the deities. She doesn't even know it. She's thinking she's giving flowers, but she's actually, oh, these flowers get offered to Krishna. She makes nice advancement. So preaching, we can just preach in so many different ways. So there's no impediments. Is there? Is there any impediments? Okay. We'll change the subject. Should we change the subject? No? We'll change the subject. <laughs> okay. What are the impediments that you can think of? Now think. What are the, some of the obstacles, the impediments in preaching? Think about it from the external point of view and think about it from your own internal impediments. What would be some impediments that stops you from preaching or makes preaching difficult? Offenses. Huh? Offenses. Offenses. Well, if you're offensive, then yeah. So what do you mean by that? That's a general term. Oh, in other words, those who are offensive, they can't, they just won't be able to. That's true. Yes. Attachment for the results. Yeah, good. Attachment to the results of our activities. We're thinking if I get some results, I'm successful. If I don't get results, then this is the worst thing. There was one story where there was there was one very senior god brother in my in our society. He arranged a college class in India, and the professor had you know asked his class. He had arranged for this you know person to come, and one student showed up. One student. I mean, so the professor said, all right, let's all go to my office. And so the preacher, my god brother, start preaching to the professor and one student. One student, that's all you might think. They made a big program, they advertised. And uh, this one student, he became so serious, he listened. Later on, he, he joined, became a devotee. Now he's a leader in the Yatra. <laughs> and he does amazing service. He's a preacher and an organizer. And he's got so many people working under him. One person. <laughs> That's all. So you might think that was a failure. But here's an example. Prabhupada was in New York. <laughs> 1966, and devotees thought, let's do a public program and invite people from the outside to hear Prabhupada. So they rented this whole auditorium, big auditorium, and they put flyers and posters all around the city of New York advertising Sila Prabhupada. And so it was time for the event, and seven people came. <laughs> big auditorium which could hold a couple hundred people. So seven people came. And Prabhupada preached like there were 700 people there. <laughs> he preached so enthusiastic. And, uh, and at the end uh, the devotees came up and to Prabhupada and said, oh Prabhupada, we're sorry. Hardly anybody came, only seven. But Prabhupada said, didn't you see? Narada Muni was here. <laughs> Narada Muni came. <laughs> so the devotees couldn't see Narada Muni, but Prabhupada could. <laughs> so you never know. And Prabhupada said that at another time, too, at another event, that Narada Muni had also come. So, yeah, we don't know. So preaching is always, what we say, beneficial. Okay, so attachment to the results. Offenses. What's another thing that causes us obstacles? Yeah. Hmm? 
if our sadhana is not good, we're not strong, we don't have the enthusiasm, or might we say the the equipment to go out and face the non-devotees, yeah. Sad, poor sadhana. Good. What's another one? Fear. Hmm? Fear. Fear. What is it? Okay. Fear of what? You're right, fear, but what, what kind of fear? What would be an example? Oh, feeling incompetent within yourself, and therefore you're fearful. Yes? Some person doesn't go to Kavinam because they, they are thinking, but if I met some friends, what can they say? Oh, seeing your old friends out there, you know, they'll think, look at him, he's just a... He's useless. <laughs> yeah. Fear of, yeah, that's fear also. Okay, what's another one? Lack of faith. Lack of faith. Don't have faith in the philosophy. And therefore you can't really speak with authority. If you can't convince yourself, you can't convince it's hard to convince others. Lack of faith. What's another one? What's an external one? Some of the external ones. The ones we meet from the outside. No money. Hmm? No money. People have no money. <laughs> hmm. What's another one? Topics. Hmm? No interest in spiritual topics. People don't have any interests, so that may be an obstacle. Okay, yeah. But low sukriti. Low sukriti. They do. Yeah. No, that's obvious. <laughs> they all have low sukriti, most of them. That's what it means to be a materialist. Some of them have good fortune, but they forgot. Most people don't have good secreti. Yes? What's another one? Big prejustices. Hmm? Big prejustices like they have already big prejustices for consciousness. Oh, they're going to see you in a certain way in which you think is not so good. <laughs> so you create, you create that. It may not be there. The prejudice might not be there, but you might create it with your mind due to your own fear. What's, what's some of the ones that come up in July and December? Uh, holiness. Hmm? Holiness. Enjoyment. Sounds good. Holiness. The enjoying spirit is too strong. Okay, what, what is, comes up in July, August, and December? And January? Hmm? The weather, okay. It's too cold. They're asking me to go out there and shiver. <laughs> or it's too hot. <laughs> okay, so too hot, too cold. That's an impediment, right? And too cold with the, the cold people, right? Makes it even colder. So these are just to explore some of the some of the impediments like that. What are some others? Devotees must be tolerant. If you're not tolerant, it's hard. Because you'll meet so many obstacles and tolerance is there. How to deal with different types of people when they respond to your approach. What to say and what not to say. How to get people to stop. Here in your country it's easy. Try New York. <laughs> Ever been to New York? <laughs> people move as fast as the cars move. <laughs> Where'd he go? <laughs> 
for New York, they'll say, get out, <laughs> go away. <laughs> and then you're just like, uh. But the roadies in New York are used to that, so they're tough. They're just as tough as the people, so. <laughs> so it's a competition who can be more tougher. <laughs> Yeah, so there's different impediments. But these impediments are chances to get beyond. Like, when I first went out, I said to my to, to leader, what should I do out there? And he said, make them laugh. So I did that. So, and when you make people laugh, they become kind of like, you know, your friend. And so, therefore, and it's easy to talk to him after that. <laughs> so it depends on your country. Your country and people, is, it's easy to stop people here generally. But in some countries it's really tough just to get them to stop. Yesterday, when I was watching the devotees trying to pass out books and cookies, people were a little bit less and receptive yesterday. Did you notice that? They were a little less receptive. Why is that? Why it seems like one day they're more receptive and one day they're less receptive? It's like a general thing. Who can answer that? Um, it depends on our uh, inner state also, or uh, maybe I'm speculating uh, it's uh, Summer and so people don't feel so much into this. But one, one summer day they're receptive and another summer day they're not. It depends on so many different It's actually easy to understand. It's the modes of material nature. Sometimes the modes of passion are stronger, sometimes the mode of ignorance is stronger, sometimes the mode of goodness is stronger. Bhagavad Gita says the modes are always in competition for supremacy. And so people are influenced by the modes. And so based on that, you can you can see how the influence is affecting people in a general sense. When you watch the general thing, how people are acting, you can see how the modes are working. <clears throat> because they don't even know they're controlled, but they are. The devotees know that people are controlled, and we can see that. <laughs> and everyone's controlled. They're completely controlled by the modes like that. <clears throat> so, and if the modes are really low, if you stop people, sometimes they become upset. So you have to see how the modes are working. That way you use different ways to speak to people. Yeah, this is becoming a little bit more precise in your ways of doing it. Okay, so, but preaching is always successful, even as Prabhupada says, even if nobody takes, still Krishna recognizes. Oh, here is one who is trying to give Krishna consciousness to another. Therefore, this devotee is very special. So everyone should try to preach. Lord Chaitanya said everyone should try to preach some way. And we mentioned yesterday that you can do it by connecting yourself with a project for preaching, or you can actually start your own little way of preaching in different ways. And we mentioned about 25 different ways yesterday, how we can, uh, we can remember some of those ways. And even sometimes start. <clears throat> There's one devotee in Croatia. <clears throat> I know he's going back to Godhead. There's no question about it. <clears throat> he's already back to Godhead, but just by the. And he's, he's his name is Narayan Pandit. Do you know him? Anybody know Narayan Pandit? He preaches in China and countries that are Muslim and, co and in, in communist countries. He does book distribution on the streets. <clears throat> I said, I talked to him about a month ago. Yeah, a month ago. And I said, I said, it must be getting easier in China. He says, no, it's getting more difficult. Because <clears throat> if you get caught, 
You're finished. <laughs> but he's he's out there. He's he's distributing Prabhupada's books to, undercover. In Turkey, he was preaching there, and it's also you know it's a Muslim country. So what he does, he goes out for about a half hour, an hour, and then he comes back home, changes all his clothes completely, puts on a new set of clothes, and goes out. And again, starts doing it. And then he, he comes back again and changes into another set of clothes. So if he's recognized that way, he, you know, he kind of hides himself. So Prabhupada said anyone who, who preaches in Muslim countries or communist countries, he's Prabhupada said, I take the dust of their feet on my head. <laughs> That's what Prabhupada said. <laughs> you can imagine Prabhupada saying that. And so here's one devotee. I mean, he's he's so simple. I mean, so he married a Chinese girl, and so he has some way of getting into the country. It makes it easier. But he's out there, and no one can distribute on the streets. It's not you can't even preach on the streets. What to speak of distributing books? <laughs> in in Russia, Russia just came up with a new law about a year ago. No one can do book distribution on the streets anymore because we were becoming too so successful uh, that there were, that the, uh, the church, the Russian Orthodox Church, put pressure on the government to stop us. So they came up with this law. No, book distribution is outlawed, but the devotees are still out there doing books. <laughs> They're still doing it because, I don't know if I ever told you that one story. <clears throat> We were in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, one, one city. I was the temple president of a small preaching center, and we went out on Harinam one day. We had about 25 devotees. And simultaneously, there was a festival in the middle of the town, which was called the Taste of Cincinnati, where all the restaurants come out and they set up booths, and they, uh, this, they, they give samples of their food to people free, so people will get an idea of their restaurants and then come visit their restaurants. In other words, it's publicity for their restaurants. So they pay money, and there's like hundreds of these booths for people giving out little free samples of whatever they you know, offer. So we came with about 25 devotees and three sannyasis. <laughs> And we were chanting and dancing, and then the police came and told us, you guys got to stop, we're getting complaints, people are, they say you're making, you're, you're disturbing their customers. <laughs> so the, the restaurant people complained. So we said, okay, but we didn't stop. <laughs> we kept going. And so we did more hurry down, and the police, after some time, came back, more complaints. We told you guys, stop. And if you don't stop, next time you're arrested. So there was one devotee there. She's a great preacher. Her name was Ladini. She's famous, actually. She had brought her Gornitai deities, which are about this big, and she set up a little book stand with the deities there. And she was selling Prabhupada's books. And so... The priest, police told us again to stop. We didn't stop. We went out and we continued. <laughs> so this time they came and they had all their paddy wagons and you know cars and they just rounded up the devotees and started arresting everybody. I escaped. <laughs> Somebody had to escape anyway. So I I, I ran from the police anyway. <laughs> But she got arrested, and when they were arresting her, they said, okay, you're under arrest. And she said, well, you, if you arrest me, you have to arrest them too, also, Gornitai. <laughs> so they said, no problem. So they arrested Gornitai. And this was <laughs> so this was a Saturday, and court is on Monday morning, so they have to stay until court. So that means they had to stay all day Saturday and Sunday. So court came on Monday morning, and the judge was there. And one of the, one sannyasi got arrested, and so the judge was nice. 
he said, you know, we have to respect these restaurant owners. They pay money, so, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. And so we're going to let you go without any fine if you promise never to do it again. <laughs> so one sannyasi said, yes, Your Honor, we promise. <laughs> But she, Landini, she said, no, we can't promise that. <laughs> and then she pointed to Gornitai, she said, this is their instructions. They have told us to go out and do this, we follow Gornitai. <laughs> she said that to the judge, <laughs> along with the police officer who was arresting everybody. So the judge, he didn't know what to say. <laughs> He looked at the police officer. The police officer just went like. <laughs> and the judge said, all right, just get out of here. <laughs> Go. <laughs> and they just dismissed the whole case. <laughs> she told them, you know, this is God, and this is his instructions. <laughs> we have to listen to God. <laughs> And she wasn't just, you know, just saying that to sound nice. She had that conviction. This was her conviction. She's an amazing person. She, she preached in Africa. She actually was killed in Africa during the preaching there. She gave her, her life for preaching. But uh, she was so amazing. She had such a, such a determination to preach Krishna consciousness. And she was good, too. And she made whole villages in Africa, Krishna conscious. She came in there, oh, there's a white lady. <laughs> they would see, oh, there's a white lady. And they all get around her, and then she would hand out, you know, prasadam to the kids, and then they would have, they would do kirtan, and the whole village would kind of like do kirtan. She, be, she was on television in Africa preaching. Amazing person. She, I mean, you know, she had such determination to preach Krishna consciousness. But she was special. She had a special relationship with Krishna that was very unique. She used to take care of Jagannath before as a pujari, and she took care of like six or seven sets of Jagannath at the same time. <laughs> and then. Uh, one time she told me, and she used to cook for Jagannath and then also do the offering at the same time. So she'd cook for Jagannath. And one time she was in a hurry to cook because it was late. And then she finished it real fast, made up the plates, put it on the altar. And then after she offered the art, art and offering, she got off the altar and crash. She goes running on the altar. Jag Balaram's plate is all over the floor. <laughs> so I asked her what happened. She said Balaram was angry. He didn't like the offering. So he threw his plate. <laughs> because Jagannath, he's very sweet. But Balaram, if you don't do it right, you're going to get it. Just can't mess around with Balaram. So, Balaram, if you have Bhagavad Balaram, so he's very strict. But when he's come as Nittai, he's very kind. <laughs> he's more lenient. So, when she was, before she was going to Africa, it was Bhakti Tirtha Swami was telling her, told her, you know, you should come and preach to Africa. She said, well, I want to come, but at the same time, uh, you know, Balaram is telling me I should stay here and do Pujari work. And Gornitai is telling me I should go preach. <laughs> and so I, she said, Nityananda is telling me to preach and Balaram is telling me to stay. <laughs> she wasn't like ma imagining this. This was her relationship with the deities. She had this special relationship with the deities. And so she said, I have to listen to Nityananda. <laughs> so she went out and preached like that. <laughs> but she said Balaram wasn't happy. Because <laughs> no one could replace her as a Pajari. She was just, she gave her life for, to serve the deities like that. So this was a person, 
And she, and she would say one thing. She says, I have no fear. She was fearless, completely fearless. She had no fear of anything. She said, I only have one fear. And she wrote it in a letter. My only fear is that I may offend a devotee. She said, that is my fear. I'm afraid of offending devotees. Amazing person, huh? She's glorified, actually. And she, she left her body saving the lives of other devotees. When devotees were being killed, she gra tried to grab the gun of the guy who was killing the devotees just to save the devotees. They weren't going to kill her because they weren't killing the women. They were killing just the men. But she couldn't tolerate devotees being killed, so she jumped onto the guy to stop him from killing the devotees, the men devotees, and then she lost her life. <laughs> She sacrificed her own life, and because of that, some devotees escaped, and she saved some of the devotees' lives. This was her. This was her. Her bhakti. And it was really, really amazing person. And uh, I used to talk to her. Her husband would always complain to me. I have a wife, but she never talks to me. I said, "Well, she's married to Jagannath. I'm sorry." <laughs> She had a husband. I think she had a husband just because she felt sorry for him. So she, he needed a wife, so she married him. <laughs> but she would have spent 24 hours a day taking care of the deities. That's all she'd do. <laughs> Amazing person. Amazing person. There's a book that's written in her honor. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Legacy of Love. I don't know if it's translated into Croatian. I know that. It's a, it's a, it's the, it's the story of her life. Uh, Bhakti Tirta Swami wrote the introduction. Radhanath Swami wrote the forward, and I wrote the epilogue, <laughs> which is the ending at the end of the book. And if you get a chance to read that book, you'll see what a per, a person who really has compassion. And that she lived simply to spread Krishna consciousness. She was fearless. There was no question. One time, they used to get, let her give class too. Sometimes she would give class. So one time she sat. It was very rare that ladies gave classes. But then because she was so special. So she came and she sat on the seat for giving class. And it was two brahmacharis right in the front. And one brahmachari said to the other brahmachari, Hey, a woman's given class. You know, like, uh-oh. <laughs> and she heard it. And what was her response? She said to them, she looked at them, Don't put me on the bodily platform. She was above her body. She had no conception of male, female like that. Like that. It was completely transcendental. She's a person that does is not really recognized much in our society because she basically did her service was Nuvrindavan and then later preaching in Africa. So she's not known around the ISKCON world so much. But she was really an exemplary person. Ladini. Ladini. You probably came by the name Ladini. Bhakti Tirta Maharaj said something interesting. He said we were connected in a previous life. Bhakti Tirta Maharaj was a mystic. And he could see things that devotees couldn't see. So he told me, he said, I was with her in a previous life in a different body. So she came to join me in my preaching in Africa. Like that, so. So she was a really very special person. So if you get a chance, the book is called Legacy of Love. It was written by two devotees, one from America and one from Germany. And they got together and they gathered information for about seven years, it took them, and found out many stories of her life. She took darshan of Jagannath for five hours one time. 
Can you imagine standing in front of Jagannath for five hours? Just take it. She'd never moved her eyes away from the deities. For five hours she just took darshan. Hmm? No, this was in New Vrindavan. Because mm -hmm. we had we had seven sets of Jagannath deities on our altar. We had one big set and we had six small sets. No, we had six sets. One big sets and five small sets. And she took care of them every day. She dressed all of them. <laughs> yeah. She was a really amazing person. She, she was an exemplary in, in the mood of preaching like that. And she left her body around the middle of September in 1990. So it's been almost 30 years since she disappeared. So I wanted to speak about her because she, she, she epitomizes uh, the mood of a preacher and that fearless and only concerned about uh, helping others like that. That was her mood. Okay, I know it's getting on. Any questions or comments about preaching? Or anything in general? Yes, what is your name? My name is Alexander. Okay, Alexander the Great. <laughs> well, every Alexander can become great, you know. <laughs> so it's just a matter of time. <laughs> What's your doubts? Prabhupada's, if you have doubts, ask questions, get your doubts removed. Uh, my doubts would be in a way that I'm not qualified enough to uh, be a preacher? Or Nobody is. Nobody's qualified. How do you become qualified? I can tell you how you come, come qualify. You have to do one thing. You have to read Prabhupada's books. You have to read, read, read. And then you become qualified. Read the books. Prabhupada said, Pre preacher means reader. If you don't read the books, you won't, you won't feel, you know, confident out there. If you read, you have that ammunition. You always have something to say. You yeah, read the books. And qualification comes by empowerment from Krishna. So if you're eager, Krishna will help you also. He'll help you. And don't be don't be unhappy because of failure. We take failure personally. And yes, you have to try. That's all. Success and failure is up to Krishna. We can't make things happen. We can only try. Krishna gives the results. Krishna says, this devotee is sincere, buy a book, and the person buys a book. <laughs> and there is also one fear. What if I, uh, when I'm preaching, I'm not um, clearly um, giving the um, message of Vasudeva like uh, like completely or um, like true because uh, I take some time learn it Sorry, yeah, practice with the devotees meet the devotees speak to them and see if, see if you can practice your preaching like that that's how I started. I practiced with my Sankirtan partner. Thank you. Ladies can preach too. Ladies are actually better. I used to go preach in colleges and high schools and then my 
you know, God brothers would come as grihasas, and the, the husband and wife would come in, they could preach much more effective than I could. Because when you go in as a sannyasi or a brahmachari, people think, I got to be like that, no wife, and no money. <laughs> But if they see people who are normal, who have families, and they're married and like that, they think, ah, oh, you know, they're like us. So they have more of a ability to listen to people who are like them. So grihastas are good preachers, really, especially in this age. Hmm. Yeah, Prabhupada, and Prabhupada said, you know, my Grihastha disciples spread Krishna consciousness. A lot of them. Another question? I thought I saw a hand. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, we shouldn't be attached to the result, but if we don't measure results, nothing much happens. Uh, well, uh, all this uh, advanced... Uh, uh, you have to act like you're attached and at mm -hmm. the same time okay. not be attached. I mean, you have to measure, you have to try for more and right. more and satisfaction. I mean, if you have to try your best. Yeah. Okay. It's, but hard. it's difficult to, to search for that. It's, you have to balance yeah. these two principles. You have to act attached, but you have to not be attached. <laughs> you have to try your best, and at the same time, know that it's up to Krishna. <laughs> That's all. Yes. Uh, I would like to share uh, the, uh, what interest uh, sometimes was uh, so magic uh, when I speak with uh, some people or friend, and then I uh, thinking from where these uh, words come. Yeah. From where? How I remember this? And this is very magic. And, Krishna uh, says, I'm in your heart. If you want to remember me, I help you. Yeah, <laughs> this is very interesting. Don't you remember the time you were in Vrindavan? What happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shall I tell the story? Yeah, it's a nice story. It was a crowded temple in Vrindavan, our Krishna Balaram temple. And Prabhupada's Guru Puja is going on, as it was just about to begin. So, Somadatri is there, just one face amongst all the crowds of devotees, the temple's packed. And she's thinking, boy, I would like to offer Prabhupada the garland. <laughs> so she starts praying like that. So the person who has the garland, he's getting he's up and he's looking around thinking who to, who to give it to and he spots her and calls her over he says here you give Prabhupada the garland he just picked this little old lady well not not too old but anyway <laughs> it's nice <laughs> out of the crowd there was so many people right it was full full temple so because she had this strong desire I want to offer this garland to Prabhupada Krishna in the heart told that Pujari, see that lady over there? <laughs> it, that's how Krishna consciousness works. We're thinking we're doing things. Krishna's saying, he's moving everything. You can't see it. <laughs> but he's moving everything. <laughs> All we can do is desire. And Krishna moves through and does the rest. So the strength of your desire makes things happen or don't happen. Mm. Yeah, everything's based on desire. Okay, maybe we desire breakfast. <laughs> okay. There's an old saying, one cannot live by philosophy alone. Srila Prabhupada ki, Srimad Bhagavatam ki.